you so much for this very warm welcome. I'm very happy to see you. Uh, you are a very difficult people to get to. <laughs> we left uh, on the 12th. We flew into um, Frankfurt, then to Amman. Had a few nights, a few hours rest, and got on, uh, got in a taxi, went to this incredible King Hussein Bridge, uh, where everything just came to a very slow molasses-like crawl. We went through six checkpoints, and then we actually got to what I suppose, I never actually saw any water. I never saw a river. Is there a river there? I, I barely saw a bridge. Um, <coughs> They took us in, well, they took me in, uh, finally, after sitting for many hours. Uh, and you all know, I'm sure, of the rudeness and the disrespect that one encounters in this place, on that bridge. Eventually, I was taken in to be interrogated. I had never been interrogated before. <laughs> yeah, it was really uh, quite a surprise. And it was a young man, and I actually ended up speaking to him as if I were speaking to my own son. Because I was saying to him, do you really understand that what you're doing is really wrong? It's just wrong. And it's not good for you. Um, <laughs> he had many questions about what I was going to be doing here and who I was going to see. And I had somehow, as soon as I got to Amman, my laptop had disappeared. And all of my material was on my laptop. And you know, when you lose your laptop or your computer, it really is as if you lose your mind. So I was completely um, unclear uh, and also jet lagged. But we managed to have a really good discussion uh, and I thought I would just tell you a little bit about it because uh, one of the things that became very clear, he was saying to me, well, um, I never heard of you. And uh, I said, fine. And he said, well, what, what have you written? And I said, well, probably nothing you've read. <laughs> and he said, well, try me. And I said, well, you probably haven't read anything, but how about the Steven Spielberg movie, The Color Purple? which he said he also had not seen. And I had thrown in the Spielberg part just to remind him that where I come from, uh, we have some different relationships with people. So he kept uh, asking me about you know, my work and my writing and all of those things. And I was surprised to see that he could pull everything up instantly on the computer. So there he had, he found me on the computer he said, you said right here, see, you said right here that you would never, that you were boycotting Israel and that you would never come to Israel. And I said, what, am I in Israel? <laughs> because, because actually, to tell you the truth, I was not ever coming to Israel, I was always coming to you. I was coming to Palestine. Um, and I have a little story that I want to tell about, uh, you know, other displaced people. In Australia, a long time ago I went to Australia. Among other things, the, grand, the Aboriginal grandmothers there taught me to hunt, so if you and I are ever somewhere and we're hungry and we can't find food, I know how. Just get me a crowbar. But we were in Alice Springs, and I was with a friend, and we were sitting, hoping that some of the native people, the indigenous people, would come by, and we could say hello, and you know, uh, we're with you. Solidarity forever. Um, and just, just be with them. Thank you. So um, we, we, we went to a little coffee shop, and we sat there, and we, we, we was, this was, I don't know, 20 years ago or 25 years ago. And actually, on the outskirts of the town, the missionaries had put boxes of clothing because they wanted to be sure that the uh, Aboriginal people, when they came through Alice Springs, which is, of course, a settler town, 
uh, they would have clothing. They would be fully clothed. So, but the Aboriginal people didn't really care much for, you know, the, the white clothing. So they would just take the clothes out of the box and they would just fling them at themselves. So that you would see a man walking along the street wearing a hat down here or a blouse thrown over his head, you know. So we, we were trying to, to attract them and, you know, figure out, well, what, this is, you know, this is a way of rejecting uh, being ruled and abused. So we, we decided that if they wouldn't talk to us, and we couldn't figure out why, why won't they talk to us? Uh, why don't they even see us? But what we didn't realize was that these people had been on that land for 40,000 years. 40,000 years. They didn't have to see us. They did not. And so we, we finally said, well, you know, maybe it has to do with sitting in chairs. Maybe if we just get off these chairs and go sit on the ground, maybe they'll see us. So we went and we sat on the ground. And within minutes, we had friends come over and sit with us because they could see us now. And they knew that we were not the people of the chairs, the recent people. So this is to say that you have been here, maybe not 40,000 years, but you've been here a very long time and that this matters a great deal. I was recently in South Africa and I was there to tell them that I had been coming to see them uh, since I was five years old. And I was coming to see them since I was five years old because my sister, uh, when I was five, taught me their freedom song, In Kosisalele, Africa. And I feel in a way that coming to see you is similar because even though I don't know your songs, and I'm sure you have a wonderful song that has kept you going all of these years, I realize that there is something of the spirit of resistance, the spirit of resilience, and the spirit of suffering that I knew from hearing this song in Kosisilele, Africa. Mm. So, so there I was in the interrogation area, and you know, really, uh, after about three hours, I was getting very tired. And finally, I said, you know, I'm not only tired, I'm thirsty, I'm hungry, and I don't know where my suitcase is. And he said, well, your suitcase is safe, you know, uh, and we continued with this, this discussion. And so one of the things we talked about, because he was, you know, busily pulling up everything I had ever said about um, Palestine, uh, was whether or not uh, Israelis and Palestinians could ever live together. Now my view is that if South Africans could live together eventually, why can't you live together? Um, and like with you, see this silence? For a moment he was just silent. And then he said, there's just too much hatred. There's just too much hatred, we'll never be able to do it. And I was very um, glad to hear his honesty. But this is a very interesting and something really needing to be discussed a lot. And I, I don't know whether you're doing this. I mean, I, I read um, Ali Abu Nima and um, Sari Makdisi. And so I know that this is in the air, that people understand that if you have what they call the two-state solution, what you will eventually have is just what they tried to have in South Africa, a lot of Bantu stands. And I don't think you really want to live in Bantu stands, and why should you? It's your country. So in a way, like the uh, Aboriginal people uh, in you know, recent Australia, because to them, Australia is recent, when I look at these walls, when I look at the barriers that are put up, um, I almost always just think about how to take them down. I, I think of ways, you know, to, to demolish them. You know, how will that happen? I don't think if it will happen. I think how will it be done? 
because it is not sustainable. This system is not sustainable. Now, as some of you know, I'm a writer, and I have been writing since I was crawling, according to my mother, who said that when she would look for me, I would be found crawling behind our shack uh, in the Deep South, completely segregated, complete apartheid. I would be there crawling in the dirt with my twig. I would have found a twig, and I would be using a twig. That makes me think that for me, writing was almost and probably was a past life activity that I came here to do the work that I do. And what is the work that I do? What is the work that I do? It's true that I, you know, some people, when you say that you're a writer, they just think in terms of, well, how many books have you written? You know, and how many this and how many that's. But for me, writing has always been about freedom. It has been about seeing the possibility for people to outgrow whatever is keeping them down and whatever is stunting them and whatever is making them smaller and meaner and crazier than they need to be. And all of you here know this so well that this system is nuts. It is absolutely crazy. And how to even survive in it I mean, just listening to the last presentation of all the permits and all of the denied entry, entries and all of the, you know, the, the horrible condescension. I mean, when I was um, at the crossing at Allenby Bridge, what struck me really deeply, because as I say, I'm from the South in, in the United States, and we are used to elders being treated with, with respect you, you just don't uh, abuse elders, and you don't abuse children, and you don't uh, insult people who are obviously ill. And I saw all of this, all of this at the crossing. People as, you know, and I, I know you know this so well, because you endure it. You know, I mean, I, I was there nine hours, but for people in this audience, I'm sure there are many people who've been there longer and still were not permitted to come into this country into Palestine. So seeing this behavior was so distressing because it, it actually means, and, and we have you know, this problem happening a lot in our country too, but when the, the elders are abused and, and, and held in contempt and the children are ignored as being children and their needs are ignored, we're seeing the ending of society. And all the power you know, in the world is not going to help. And in fact, I said to this young man, I said, you know, uh, I don't know if you know this, but we're running out of money in America. We, we can't afford this. We can't afford to keep giving you money. And <clears throat> that our resources are finite. And we've used them up. And the parts that we did not use up, Wall Street stole from us. So we're, in, we're really in bad shape. We cannot keep up Israel. We can't afford it. We have given Israel a trillion dollars. A trillion. Now, I have no idea how much that is. <laughs> but it is a lot. It is a lot, a lot, a lot, because, you know, in a, just in a regular year, it's three billion. And then you add on to that all the billions for armaments. I mean, as if the world needs any more arms. Now, do you think the world needs any more arms? I mean, really. I mean, who needs more weapons? I think war is, you know, in Mexico, I lived in Mexico part of the time. In Mexico, the most harsh, thing you can say to someone is that you're stupid. That's, that's you know, and I, I, I'm always learning Spanish, but I'm afraid to ask them, why is that so, what, what makes the word stupid, tonto, so awful? Um, because I just feel like it's going to be just, you know, profane and dreadful and everything. But war is all of that. War is all of that. Buying weapons, spending money on weapons is so incredibly stupid. We're smarter than that, aren't we? I mean, just as human beings. 
Aren't we smarter than just to spend all of this money on weapons and then to leave people to have nothing? To have people sick and dying, the children crying, you know, the mothers crawling around trying to find food, af afraid, you know, living in houses that these giant bulldozers come and smash, I think, that the first time I was pulled into the Palestinian story uh, was, I think, around 1967, maybe the war, that war. And I was so appalled that they took the, that Israel took the land and didn't plan to give it back. And I said to someone, well, they have to give it back. You don't just go in and take people's land and never give it back. I mean, they said, oh, this happened to be someone who was pro, pro the war and pro Israel. He said, oh no, they need that land, you know. They need that land because otherwise they'll be able, especially the Golan Heights, which I believe belonged to Syria. They need that land because otherwise the people will throw bombs, you know. But actually, uh, that was one of the, the, the periods when I really felt very close but the other time, and there are many times, I mean, I, we don't have long enough time here to talk about all the times, but because as a person growing up poor in the South, sharecropper parents being forced to move every year and living in terrible housing, the first time I saw the demolition of a house that somebody was living in, I almost could not bear it. I don't see how the world bears this. How can we bear this? You know, as a planet, how can we bear watching people in these giant caterpillars, you know, and, and hopefully the boycott will help take care of caterpillar. But how can we bear to watch this? You know, to watch people just destroy something so incredibly precious, you know? And in fact, last, in uh, 2009, we were in Gaza. We went, uh, that's sort of a long story, but my sister had died. And I learned that, that in one uh, bombing, five uh, children, girls, had been killed and their mother was unconscious. And it, it clicked for me just how precious anybody's life is. It doesn't matter. You know, whether you know them, whether you don't. So we went to Gaza. And we found there just exactly what I was afraid of, which is that the hatred that has been permitted, partly by my government, to grow, to fester, has blossomed, a malevolent blossom, into this incredible destruction. Now, I have only a few minutes more. And briefly, I want to say to you, what I actually came here to tell you, which is that the suffering, and all of us have suffered so much, uh, my country, your country, you know, decades and centuries, but actually suffering does have a purpose. And the purpose of it, one of them, is that it helps you connect. It opens you in a way to the suffering of other people. And that it is when we gather together that we know our strength. I mean, remember that scene in Tahrir Square where the people surrounded the tanks so much that the tanks couldn't move? That's what it is. It's, it's beginning to know that we are one and we are us and not any separation at all. We are one, one expression of humanity. And that we must... So I... I am just delighted to be here and it's one of the great joys of my life to spend that time in detention uh, because I know that that is what it means to love humanity. It means to, to show up when we need each other, to show up, just be there.